Layovers, your weekly dose of aviation innovation. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard from the flight deck. This is Paul Pavadivitriou. Hello everybody, this is Alex Hunter. We'll be your pilots for this show about the news, the startups and the technologies defining the modern air travel experience. Our flight time today, an hour and four minutes, and we expect on time arrival. Coming up on this flight, technologies for better passenger flows at Dubai airports. Get paid to advertise on your carry-on. A smart travel lock. Don't post your boarding passes on Instagram. The CIA advises you to keep your story simple at airports. The inevitable downsizing of Air France, the success of India's Indigo, the grandeur of Etihad's residence, Russia's new aircraft gets its first orders, and the last flight of US Airways. As we reach our cruising altitude, I'm going to turn off the fast seatbelt sign for you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and let's turn on those noise cancelling headphones. Flight 27 to Frankfurt. Frankfurt. I am amazed that we haven't covered Frankfurt yet, given that you practically live there with all of your comings and goings and your loyalty to Lufthansa. Oh, yeah, well, it's I have mixed feelings about the airport, but we'll, we'll get to that at the end of the show, guys. Uh, first, uh, two thanks. Uh, one to Kendall. She's always listening to us, and she tweeted yesterday that we were one of the best sources for airline news, so that's very, that's kind. very kind. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank really, you. thank you so much. Uh, we know as well that we are sometimes on a some kind of a time shift. So, you know, we record it one day and then there's a few days before the show is on. So forgive us as well for that. Uh, oh, another thank you to uh, Vicky Kolovu uh, from Greece at Netwire on uh, Twitter. Uh, she asked me a question. I mean, she said, oh, I want to give you feedback about some of my own experiences. So I just want to remind people they can simply send us an email at hello at layovers.2 or simply go on our Facebook page and private message us and we'll get uh, all these messages. We cannot always cover them, but we'll try our best, uh, especially if the stories are uh, fascinating. And also uh, one other one is uh, Greg Annandale did confirm that he has flown on Norwegian nine times. Oh, wow. And says uh, he, he ha they have great service and he has zero complaints. So that's, uh, that's, an, that's good feedback. We should absolutely try to fly them. Yeah. Alex. I really want to know what all the fuss is about. Uh, but first, uh, of course, uh, the big news this past few days, we're recording on a Monday, uh, the, the 2nd of November, the crash of that uh, airliner in Egypt. Yeah, very strange. Lots of speculation, of course, as these things happen. When it, when it doesn't happen in a, in a developed nation with a, a developed nation airline, speculation runs rampant. And I think it's always exacerbated when it's another country's airline and then another country's aircraft or the manufacturers from another country in another country's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So it just uh, already the speculation is running rampant. The PR damage control is going crazy and we're getting yeah, so basically what happened, of stories. I mean, what we know, the only thing that actually we know, there's a plane crashed the other day. It apparently dislocated uh, in air, so mid-air. It, it didn't crash and dislocate it on the ground. That's all we know. And then obviously people started saying, oh, it's been shot down by a missile. There's even been like a video, maybe doctored. We don't know. Nobody can verify it. Uh, there's been accusations of having a bomb, of course, inside the plane. We are not here to speculate, but the most likely scenario is still that it had a simple failure. Uh, simple, I say that as if it was uh, not a big thing, but it has a fail. It has a failure. It, it did had a tail strike back in two thousand and one, and we know from history that airlines like Japan Airlines one two three or China Airlines I think six eleven were in that kind of situation. The repairs just don't last, and at some point it break down. It yeah. doesn't mean that it's that. Maybe it's another scenario, but I wish people were starting with the most mundane. I'm sorry to say, use that term mundane scenario before going into the whole crazy scenarios right? yeah yeah and I mean, just to recap the facts it was an a321 operated by a russian charter airline from sharm el sheikh to saint petersburg and the a321 is historically an incredibly safe and reliable airplane um, absolutely and yeah as you said there's a, there's been all kinds of, of theories about this um 
from the benign to the outrageous. Um, but you know, firstly, it's a, it's a tragedy. A lot of these people were were holiday makers, honeymooners. Yeah. It's 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 really frightening. And I said to Paul yesterday, the day before, that flying feels risky at the moment. It's not statistically. It's 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 absolutely no. not. But right now, it just it feels strange with having you know having to divert or go on longer routings to go avoid being shot down. In 2015, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's true that it's, it's uh, extraordinary. Uh, it's true that major outlets like CNN, the Telegraph, other outlets have reported of possibility. They, of course, they don't say it's, it's a plausible scenario. Uh, I've asked a friend of mine who was a security officer at the United Nations, who's telling me that uh, the kind of capability to shut down a plane for such rebel forces, apparently, again, you know, we're not here to do any politics. Is unheard of, and you know, the, you, you cannot just people imagine you can just trigger a button and then shut down a plane like this. It's not as easy, yeah. so it doesn't seem very plausible. But again, well, we're open to discussion. The thing is, obviously, like you say, that creates this kind of fear about flying for some people. Actually, for uh, some airlines, have already diverted. They're not flying over Sinai, which is a part of Egypt where the plane crashed. Emirates has stopped. Air France and Lufthansa, BA doesn't say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> strange, yeah, they don't comment on this type of thing. They just say that they, they, their routings are based on 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 safety. But now, basically, uh, we'll we will learn what will what would happen. But it's true that uh, was it this morning? Uh, the PR from the airline or the the company is a bit sketchy, yeah, to say the least. They've made some outrageous claims. That there's no way that they could possibly validate these claims at this stage of the investigation. Um, they're basically an saying, Airbus doesn't dislocate in midair. Yeah, uh, which you can't you can't make a comment like that. I mean, if there was a st structural issue with the airplane based on uh, that that tail strike back in 2011, you, 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 it's irresponsible for them to make a comment like that at this stage. And it now looks like the latest news is that it was there was no sign of any external. Contact, I think, is the phrase that they used, meaning that it wasn't hit by a, a missile. But it's yeah. it's such a strange and irresponsible thing for them to claim it at this stage, and it's it's pure it's pure brand PR on their side. It's it's, it's disgusting, frankly. Yeah, and, and uh, U.S. Director of National Intelligence has said there's no evidence of terrorism as of yet. So again, it's you know these kind of news that grabs the headline uh sadly because i'd rather not have to think that a flight that we can take you and me alex would be shut down but it's true that it the news cycle kind of sometimes requires these kind of outrageous remarks because this is what makes people tick and this read i'm not going to call it clickbait but you know yeah it's 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 sad it's just it's a sad time really Anyway, we'll learn more. I mean, we're not here to dis to uh, discuss always about crashes, but of course, if there's something interesting about this one, it might just be, again, a, a purely mechanical failure uh, out of the repairs. We'll probably learn more. These type of operations take time, uh, so it will be out of the new cycle before we start learning uh, anything. But uh, so, guys, don't stop flying because of these kind of news, please. No. Uh, next piece of news, uh, which is a bit similar, uh, in the, it, but it's more worrisome to me, uh, we found that it, uh, it was a few weeks ago, or even a few months ago, that they say there was a report that said that some of the U.S. air traffic controllers were found to have a lack of sleep that was disturbing. Yes, yeah, on average, the controllers were getting three and a quarter hours of sleep on days they worked overnight and that you can't function on that. And what I don't, what I can't comprehend is that for a role that is so critical to infrastructure and transport and safety and the economy of not just developed nations, but the entire world, that they don't seem to be getting the support that they need to, to do this, both kind of on a, on a, human resources level and also on a, on a technology level and infrastructure level. It's, it's mind boggling, really. Yeah, I think people, most people that fly do not realize what kind of work is required to make our flights safe. I mean, simply the routing and everything so that planes do not hit each other midair. And it's true that it's uh, when you read uh, reports like that, it's a bit uh, worrying because you, I, I agree. 
you know, you wish this is one of the foundations of flying. Yeah, you cannot, absolutely. You can work without ATC. And it's too it's so sad that apparently they don't get the support. And if, of course, if you if you read this, the, the lack of sleep, three hours, yeah. I mean, how can they function during, you know, their working hours? I mean, I'm not blaming them, by the way. I'm just blaming, I don't know, the system. It's a bit easy to blame the system, but it's, it's something should be done. And I don't even want to know what happens in other countries because probably well, yeah. no is better. Exactly. And I think, you know, th this study that was done by, by the FAA, um, it's, it's not, you know, hundred percent scientific. They, you Obviously know, they, they, they did things like uh, strapping, uh, sleep monitors to 211 controllers for two weeks. Um, but the data they got from that is on average, they only got 5.8 hours of sleep per night, even if they were working a day shift. And then if they were working a night shift, it fell to that three and a quarter hours. But they surveyed 3,300 controllers, and and 61 percent of them said that they found them they caught themselves about to doze off on the job at some point in their careers. So uh, it was done. The, the study was done by NASA on behalf of the FAA. So it's it's you you hope that they do something about this. I don't know. Again, we we, we should we should revert back to our our friend uh, Dan, the SFO controller, and and see what his take on this is but it's yeah gosh it's it's worrying isn't it and as you say i don't i don't want to know ignorance is bliss <laughs> about what happens in in countries with less kind of oversight than than places like the us yeah but still uh these guys and if any of those are listening to us you you're doing a great job so yeah not please read us as, as as criticizing what you guys are doing you're doing a great job the fact that flying is so safe nowadays is also thanks to you clearly Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Just, a, uh, just wish the industry was sometimes more supportive, or at least made people aware of this kind of work that most people just, I think, just, just don't know. Yeah. Uh, to Europe, uh, Air France. So we, we, we talked, of course, about Air France quite a few times in the past episodes. Uh, they're part of a group, Air France KLM. They've been having a lot of issues, like other airlines in Europe, uh, Lufthansa, uh, because of the pressure from one side, remember this was a long story we kept using in the first episodes between the Middle Eastern airlines and the other side, the uh, low cost airlines. And Alex, you had found an article that uh, that said, could Air France shrink like Alitalia? Alitalia, I remind you, is part of that same group. Uh, and it's worrying because you can see that this is typically, uh, and I think I've hinted at that a few times in past episodes, it's typically a company that seems a bit stuck uh, for various reasons. And they, their model hasn't really evolved and they have the pressure of both sides, especially, to be honest, from the low cost here because the low cost are eating their market and there doesn't seem to be a way out. They have issues with the unions. So there, was, uh, uh, there was a strike uh, that happened uh, a few weeks ago, and there was even and that was kind of almost crazy. Yeah, uh, you've seen some of the executives from from Air France that were attacked by some of the demonstrators. You could you could see images uh, where their clothes were ripped off. And yeah, it was the, it was the bad. Level of anger is really high. Okay, these people are prosecuted. Apparently, this is what we're hearing. But the point is, it shows how stuck they are and how risky they are because they're not making that much money. No, it's not. And as you're absolutely right. They're getting squeezed on all sides. They're getting internationally, they got huge competition from from the ME3 and others who who run that sort of hub model. And then you have the low cost carriers, the EasyJets and the Ryanairs who are eating up the domestic and regional competition that feed into those money making long haul routes as well. Absolutely. So and then the pressures from from unions, when they try and enact any kind of cost-saving measure, the unions are up in arms for you know for for right or wrong, better or worse. It's not not for. Us I mean, to we've comment. experienced that, we've, we've experienced that with Lufthansa. Lufthansa has had, which is also very unheard of for Germany, has had like a lot of strikes. Less so this year, thankfully. But uh, again, same thing. They have to revisit the business model. This is probably one of the only ways to survive, but it doesn't go well, and it's. And at the same time, the low cost carriers are growing like crazy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I said last week that uh, we are both using these uh, pricing um, websites, you know, to uh, get fare alerts. And I see, 
you can go to Berlin for 20 quid. You can go to like all around Europe for the price of a cab fare. Yeah. There's just no way that this are going to disappear. This is probably part of the, a big part of the future of flying and the flag carriers or the traditional carriers have to react. And sadly, I don't see any other way out than to restructure their business model. It, it feels, I mean, they are a cash rich organization even though their their profit margins or, or their operating margins are super, super thin, you feel like with oil price the way it is that they've got to go, you know, hell for leather and really grow and compete against these guys that are that mm-hmm. are putting them in this pressure, pressure in the first place as opposed to, to cut back. It just seems like a an opportunity to really reinvent themselves. Yes. And there's also an unwillingness, since the topic was on Air France, there's an un- unwillingness from Air France to really develop its own low cost model. Uh, there's a, there are agreements because of the unions uh, to limit the number of aircrafts they can deploy under their low cost model, which also limits what they could do. They could even try themselves to uh, compete. We know that both of us have a are always asking our, ourselves a question, how can a traditional flag carrier have at the same time a low-cost structure because it competes with itself? But at least they're trying. But in France, they cannot even try to the full extent because they have limits due to agreements with, with unions. Yeah. So it's a, and probably I hear so from the inside, from uh, I'm not going to name my sources, but I also hear there's a, a culture uh, that is also stuck. The culture of, okay, Air France is big national company. Mm. We're going to... We're going to feed Paris, and from Paris, you're going to travel the world. And they still see that, at least for some executives, as the model to follow, and they cannot accept the new reality. I will just direct you. There's a nice piece in the Wall Street Journal about Air France and Lufthansa, about their issues currently. I'll just uh, just follow the link of the show notes. It gives you a good overview of the, the, the little issues they have. On the other hand, in other continent Indigo. Uh, have you ever, you don't you have never flown Indigo, right? No, but I was really uh, when I was in Mumbai, they were all, all, obviously all over Mumbai Airport. There was there was tons and tons and tons of them, and I I did a little kind of I I didn't really know much about them, but I did I was amazed to find out how frequently they they've won uh, Skytrax awards. Yes, for being absolutely. the best low cost uh, airline in their their region in Central Asia and India, they've won it over and over and over and over again, being the best low cost carrier. So good for them. And uh, again, can I send me a story that uh, so they are doing an IPO, and the IPO is subscribed more than six times, <laughs> meaning that you know there's a huge interest. Of course, we 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 said many times over that India one was one of the growth markets in the world, but. It shows that a uh, low cost model, of course, there is, is, will be the winning one probably. But I mean, look at the success story. I mean, it really shows you something, a radically different image from what we've hearing just before with Air France and KLM. This is yeah. amazing. It is uh, amazing. I've never flown them either. I would, I, I would love to try one. So I'm sure it must be quite interesting to, to see. And if anyone, again, from uh, countries like India, as as experiences flying these low cost airlines, we really want to. Yeah, uh, we could even invite you on the show because I'd love like to know what it's like. Exactly, how different it can be from us, you know, living in the old world and living yeah. in London, <laughs> uh, Russia. But this time for a, a g- good news uh, with uh, the Sukhois. Yeah, this is really interesting. I I was surprised by this timeline, and I was also surprised by this announcement in general. So, CityJet who have recently sort of been flying on their own brand, but were a uh, subsidiary carrier for people like Air France and KLM and a few others, I think, based in Dublin, but they have a lot of operations out of, out of London City. They have announced an agreement to lease 15 Sukhoi Superjets with an option for another 10, and they will start arriving in February of this year. I, I remember when we were talking about, I think it was Mitsubishi, we were saying yeah. that Sukhoi doesn't have a lot of luck these days. I mean, they haven't really made orders. And this is, this has surprised me as well. I mean, it's good for them. It's, it's, great. A, it's nice to have competition. Uh, which other airliner would you compare it to, Alex? Uh, the new, Probably the new uh, Bombardier, the C-Series. Uh, I think it's coming into the space of the uh, the E-170. 
Correct. The Ember 17, which is such a great airplane. Uh, what they're doing is they're replacing their Avro RJ 85s with, yes. with yes. the Super Jet, yes. <laughs> which I think you know I think is a shame. I think the the I'm not a big fan, but yeah, I get it. The 80, RJ 85 is such an unusual airplane, a small absolutely. regional four engine airplane. Of course, it makes absolutely zero economic sense, but you know what? I don't care. Um, <laughs> but but what's interesting, I think, about this is the timeline. I after that prototype crashed. I thought that was it for this program. I thought we're never going to see a super jet outside of Russia. But obviously, the guys that run City Jet have I've been convinced that this is a safe, economic, comfortable airplane, and they've committed to, to twenty five of them. I'm looking forward to try them because City Jet we could be close to home. So uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure they must be really good. I mean, the, the, the Russian industry has a long history of creating aircraft. It's true that they have sometimes had a bad reputation, but it is mostly due not to engineering, but to the economic collapse after the end of the USSR, and thus planes were not probably uh, well-maintained. But the actual truth is that they have great engineers, and I'm sure that they, they could see a revival with the Sukhoi. So yeah. I hope yeah, I hope they can score some other orders. And, and on the same, same day, uh, actually this morning, it was announced that China's first domestically made commercial airplane – the, the Comac 919 has, has come off the production line for the very first time today. It looks it looks great. It looks really, really neat. It's very – the nose is very Boeing-y. boeing um, yeah, a bit. I agree. But uh, it looks like, you know, it looks like the rest of it. It looks like a, 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 the C-Series. looks like the Super Jet. I don't know who their customers are uh, at the moment, but uh, – you know, they probably yeah, they probably start with uh, with a local. I mean, local is a huge country, but they'll probably start with uh, some Chinese customers first. But uh, to those who always are like, oh yeah, well the Chinese, you know what? Uh, I'll keep an eye on this uh, on the comic because it will probably at some point in time we'll see it more and more in disguise, and it will be welcoming when they start doing the larger aircraft to have a third entrant. Between Boeing and Airbus, nothing. I have nothing against Boeing and Airbus, but it creates, it's nice to have competition. Well, you know what's crazy is the C nine one nine has the smallest model. It seats one hundred and fifty six. Yeah, so it's in sort of A three A three nineteen seven thirty seven territory, and the biggest one is one hundred and seventy four. There have been five hundred orders for this airplane. I just had a look, and all of them except for twenty have come from Chinese airlines or Chinese uh, banks. So GCAS of order 20 and everything else is Chinese. But but I think you're right. I think you're going to see a lot of people flying this this airplane outside of China as well. It looks it looks really it looks great. They, they have orders. Uh one that is struggling, like two that are struggling, is first uh, the 747-8. Uh we still haven't flown them. Uh I wish we will soon. We know that Lufthansa has some. Uh we mentioned, I mean, you mentioned Alex, uh it was like Quite a long time ago, that uh, Transairo, which is also a Russian company uh, airline, had uh, ordered some 747 and some A380. Uh, we already knew that the A380 were basically out of the game, but now we're basically learning that Transairo, as it's going for bankruptcy, will also cancel its orders for the 747. So, yeah, ouch. I heard a rumor that Aeroflot are taking some of those orders. Of the seven four seven eight. Oh, the seven four seven. Yeah, maybe not of the A three eighty. Not three A three eighty. Yeah, I'm not worried about the A three eighty. I think the A three eighty is going to be fine as long as people people keep buying the um the seven the seven four seven. Keep that production line open for just a little bit longer. So bad news for you then, because uh, Saudi Airlines is considering buying the A three eighty to replace the seven four seven. They have quite a lot of seven four sevens, but instead of going for the dash eight. They are thinking about going for the A three eighty. So sorry, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's, it's a uh, what, whatever. There's a for those interested in the A three eighty. I'll put a link on the show notes. There's a production list. It's a very well done. You you can see all the A three eighties are already been delivered. Are thus in disguise. Those who are being uh, currently uh, produced and the or remaining orders. There's not that many orders. I mean, you say they'll be fine. It's true that we've heard. Uh, CEO of Airbus uh, saying multiple times that 2015 should be the year where the program breaks even, but they have a lot of pressure from Emirates to come up with a new version of the A380. I'm not sure how how this all would play yeah, out. We, we've really heard nothing concrete, have we? Ever since that back and forth between Emirates and Airbus about the re-engined or re-engineered version, there hasn't been anything concrete out of either camp. 
let's not forget. Uh, so Emirates had a few other Airbus before, uh, but they're ditching everything else. So basically now they will basically rely on A380 and 777. So if Airbus wants to sell any more planes to uh, to Emirates, they have to probably yield a little bit. Uh, they still have there's still a lot of uh, A380s coming up from Emirates. By the way, they're still you can take a look at that list I've just mentioned you guys and you'll see that Emirates is still poised to get a lot of A380s and it's, it, it remains your best shot if you want to try an A380 yeah <laughs> it's just so the future of the A380 is and certain analysts are fighting over uh, is was it a good bet or not but uh, the one that the A320 is the one that is massively successful yeah. it's incredible they, it they, really they, is. They, even accelerating the production is crazy yeah that plane is is proven to be hugely popular and I think when you have Big airlines basing their entire fleets around them, EasyJet and loads and loads of others. I think people like BA are consolidating their short haul around the A320 as their 767s retire eventually, 757s retire eventually. Those are all being replaced by A320s. It is an extraordinarily successful airplane. It's a very, I like it. I like it too. Uh, so I'm happy to to see that they are boosting production and they cannot. Co- they just have so many orders. Uh, I haven't checked the latest. You know, you can find online. I'll find you maybe a link where you can find the different how Boeing and Airbus are stacking uh, mm-hmm. up against each other. And the A320 is really boosting Airbus to yeah. crazy. It's life. always interesting. You look at those those those. They're almost bar, always bar graphs, and it's right. it's this. You know. Relatively small bumps for the A380s, 747s, uh, 787s, and all that. And then when it gets to the A320 and 737, respectively, there's this huge spike yeah. <laughs> because they're very versatile airplanes. They can fly. Absolutely. I mean, Virgin America is just about to start, I think maybe even today, start flying from the West Coast to Hawaii using A320s um, nice. and, and 321s and, and members of that family. So it's. But also then they do them to down to LA and all in shorter hops as well. So it really is an extremely versatile airplane. And about, I'm about to fly in a few days uh, Air Astana A320. So I'm looking forward to, yeah. to see that. They, uh, I'm flying out from Astana in Kazakhstan to Istanbul. Uh, so it's a code share with Turkish, which is actually Air Astana. And most of their, you directed me to look it up. Most of their aircrafts are actually less than a year old. It's yeah. pretty amazing. So Except really for the ones forward. that I'm flying on, which are 757s, which are around. Yeah, but you're flying a different route. You're going to Frankfurt, correct? Frankfurt, yeah. Frankfurt to, to Astana, which is a surprisingly long way. Yeah, it is actually. Uh, we'll talk about this crazy travels we're both about to undertake. We'll talk about it in the next episode after we've done them because we'll have fun stories. But uh we're both happy to try the uh, Air Astana for a, a new airline. Yeah, anyway. that doesn't happen very often, does it? No. Still on Airbus, uh, the A350. So I, I'm going to admit that publicly when it comes to the shape of air, of, of the aircrafts, I always had, since I was a kid, a, a small preference for Boeing. Uh, I always found the the personality of the aircraft slightly better on Boeing against Airbus. But for once... I'm going to change my stance because uh, Finair just released a video. Uh, they're receiving the A350 mm. uh, XWB. What an aircraft. Yeah, it, it looks amazing. You're, you're right because the A380 is a, is a horrifically unattractive airplane. But the A350 is a beautiful airplane. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's probably be, it, w- it might become my favorite in terms of the nose, yeah. the, the windows, a, the wings, you know, how they uh, tip upwards. Yeah. It's great. It's, it's a little, it's a, like like so many Airbus airplanes, it's it's a little kind of lanky and disproportionate. Uh, like the, you know, the A34600 is a ridiculous looking airplane. And I think the A350 has kind I'm of got that, that, I guess. that <laughs> DNA, but, um, you know, compared to the, to the Dreamliner, which is a, and the, and the triple sevens, which are beautifully kind of symmetrical airplanes, but the, yeah, the A350 is just an incredibly <laughs> elegant airplane. You were about to fly it. I think, or- yeah, in the April, I'll be flying it. Oh, okay. So we have time. Not, to I still have time to beat you and fly. Yeah, I, no, I don't think I'm flying at any time soon. <laughs> I, I, I'm flying with Etihad soon, finally after five years. But I don't. I'm not flying uh, A350. Sadly, I wish I, I wish I would. Uh, or is it Qatar that has one? Now I'm not sure anymore. Uh, I think they both might have them. Though. 
Uh, last piece of news about Airbus, it was all over the news a few weeks ago that uh, it's a patent. So, of course, patents are what they are. They can just be put in a drawer and we forget about them. But still, that one was just crazy. It's a new type of seating. It just Can you even describe how... You know what? I, I was looking at this before we started recording going, how how do you even describe this? It's As the article on The Verge describes it, it's not a torture device nor is it a geometric painting from one from an abstractionist masters it is somehow a proposed seating arrangement for aircraft brought to you by the sadists at airbus <laughs> i think it's a great quote who have now resorted to physically stacking passengers on top of one another and basically it's this it's almost like kind of this tiered mezzanine seating so you would have a layer of passengers and then above them I, but in the same cabin yeah another layer of passengers yeah like almost passengers like top. yeah it like does, a ski lift almost yeah. it's it's it, the it's most hard. ridiculous or thing think I've of ever the YMCA seen. when you have the bunk beds and you have one on top of the other <laughs> yeah. it's really it's really hard to 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 understand how would people go up and because you know it's a patent so it's not like of course finished designs and it might never see the light of day but when you look at that, I mean, we know that, you know, uh, airlines are especially low cost, want to cram more people in, within aircrafts, and we're arriving at the limits of what the legroom can offer. Uh, we've been talking about Kendall's at, at petition at Flyers' Rights, you know, to put a moratorium on the legroom reducing in the US. Mm. But this, I, in, for instance, in terms of, I, I always come to the same point, I know, but in terms of evacuation, how do you evacuate if you're on top of someone else or yeah. you need to, if you drop your phone? <laughs> I don't know. I just thought. Oh, God. Yeah. Just, yeah I, I, so, I, I, you know, as you say, a lot of these patents are just are land grabs. And, but I also know that with some patents, the juice is hidden in the detail. Yeah, like you're the, right. The, there's some there's some design element in there that, in the big scheme of what the patent application looks like, seems inconsequential. But that, like, it might be a hinge or a uh, a, a reconfiguration of the overhead bins or something. That that's what they're actually trying to protect, and they're obfuscating it with this nonsense about medieval torture chairs. <laughs> you know, so it would be interesting to kind of pick it apart and figure out what they're actually doing. But so many of those are, are just sort of IP protection yeah. nonsense. But talking about the opposite end of the spectrum, you found a, uh, an amazing report on uh, airliners about the apartment, which is that crazy, fantastic first class. It's not even first class at this point from uh, Etihad, right? Yeah. So airliners.net is a wonderful and frustrating resource at the same time they've the civil aviation forum which is by far the most active is full of great information it's also full of the standard youtube comment drivel that you get in any community mm -hmm. but the trip report forum is almost always fantastic I agree. with yeah. really well written beautifully photographed amateur trip reports from premium cabins which is interesting because we never get to go in them but also on airlines that you're never going to get a chance to fly on as well but this one i think takes the cake because it's a it's a standard passenger i.e not press or pr report of what it's like to go in one of etihad's apartments on an a380 and it really is something else isn't it yeah. the the space the food the amenities just the the thought behind it, the fact that they refer to it as an apartment, is such such a different tone because in your mind. There's about multiple what you're, rooms. Yeah, there are multiple system. rooms. There's a couch that turns into a full bed. There's two seats. The whole thing is controlled by uh, an LCD touchscreen yeah, panel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can describe this. There's a closet. That I can describe this till the cows come home. But you guys really need to go and have a look at it. There's a fridge. Full of drinks and snacks, uh, and of course, if you want to pay that for from your own money, it's about forty thousand dollars. So you might not probably this person. I haven't read uh, the report in full. Uh, find a way to get that via air miles. Uh, I'm not sure, but this probably is your best bet if you ever want to go, unless you're very wealthy. And this, if you do that, just offer also a ticket to Alex and myself. We'd love to try it once. <laughs> he said that he got the, and yes, I'm going to reiterate what Paul just said. If you feel like putting this up there, we would definitely not say no. This guy used his American Airlines miles to. Do uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, 
cool ways to do it. Uh, it's always, it's a bit, for us, we suffer because it always seems that if you have miles accrued in the US, you can get better deals in such airlines than if you accrue miles from Europe. So, but, yeah. uh, well, it's also interesting to note that the airline doesn't have that many A380. It doesn't plan to actually have a, that many A380. It's, uh, it's really something they do on very specific routes. It's almost like marketing because they know that it's not a product that will get for everyday people. But at the same time, if you remember the design of the A380 on the top level, it's as the same position where uh, Emirates has put its uh, spa, which are the two showers, which I had I've been lucky to try once. The reason as well why they try to find something different at, is that at the front of the upper deck, the, the ceiling goes quite low very quickly, which doesn't really allow to put a lot of seats. So in terms of the use of space, having something like that doesn't really use that many other, you know, the space that could have been taken by other seats. It would be interesting to see what happens when, uh, because I've never flown it, with Emirates that now goes two class, and they remove the first class and they put uh, coach seats uh, in the front of the upper deck to see how far uh, uh, ahead they go. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I think um, you could look that up on Seeker and see the kind of general layout of the of the, of the the upper deck. But it, they have the showers as well, and apparently you get one extra minute than Emirates. So. <laughs> <laughs> this, this guy actually pointed that what? out. You know, <laughs> I got an I important think, detail. Five I think, minutes. I, I think when I when I uh, yeah, well, you know what? I never finished my uh, the amount of minutes I had with 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 the shower. So honestly, I don't know if it really makes a difference. But maybe just for boasting. It's really- <laughs> <laughs> uh, still on uh, still on that debate because you know we haven't we've for three episodes I think we haven't talked about the big debate between the Middle Eastern uh, airlines on one yeah, side and the US airlines. So it's a bit refreshing because it means that probably now a lot of things are happening behind the scenes a lot of the shouting is kind of quiet down but you know there was some news again and uh, you found an article about the US Justice Department This is crazy I I was in a way, hoping for this, but I don't know. think I was expecting it. But the U.S. Justice Department has basically come out and said, hey, American big guys, we actually don't think you have a case here. And I think the skift to – I mean this is why one of the many reasons why I love skift. At the very beginning of every article or almost every article they post, they put kind of their – brief analysis of it. And I think they've nailed it. And they said, the only groups to openly side with United American and Delta are mayors of cities dependent upon them for airlift and the unions will work work for them. On the other side of the debate, everyone else, including now the US Justice Department. So yeah, I think when the US Justice Department, who are responsible for, amongst other things, looking at monopolies or anything that that inhibits competition come out and say, yeah, we don't think this is going to be a thing. We're going to look into it. But that's pretty damning. Um, Yeah, it is. Uh, We'll see. There was another story. Uh, So uh, Emirates is open. It's uh, a route to Atlanta. And uh, Delta came out and said, we're canceling our own route from uh, Atlanta to Dubai because of unfair competition. And because anyway... and the proof they they were saying the proof is that this was a money loser. So there's no way that these guys would be able to make money showing that it's uh it's that the airline is being subsidized. I don't, yeah. But the only thing is that apparently it's it's not a money losing route at all. Actually, it was actually a route that it are uh, I think the load factor was over eighty five percent, which. In my book, is not a money losing round. No, <laughs> and probably Delta just either was probably maybe afraid of the competition. They couldn't actually compete with the product Emirates was was dealing with. Maybe simply was another strategic decision that had nothing to do with Emirates, but it was an easy way out to just spin it on 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 a Middle Eastern carrier. Yeah. So uh, the Emirates actually replied to that and said, showing some numbers, saying, "Guys, come on, it's not a money losing route. Don't you can you can you can change your routing as much as you want. Just do not pretend it's our fault that you stop flying." Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'll put as well a link for with a full comment. It's, it's pretty pretty interesting. Still in uh, in the Arab Peninsula, Peninsula. Sorry, 
there was a very interesting article. I'm not going to go over uh, it entirely from Sita. Uh, they interviewed the, I think, the CEO of the uh, airports Dubai. So it means both the uh, DXB, which is the, the airport at Dubai that most of you might know if you've ever flown to Dubai or through Dubai, and the new airport, uh, Al Maktoum, uh, Dubai World, I think it will be called, which is uh, being now uh, constructed. I mean, it's, it's already open, but it's still rather small. The, the interesting bit about this article was not about this, because you can find information about the, the, these amazing airports online. We've covered already the DXP. It was about the technology that they were deploying in those airports. And one comment that really struck me, he says, if you double the process flow, so how passengers are moving it within an existing terminal, you can double the capacity. That's far, far cheaper than having to double the area of a terminal building. And he says the way to do that is to give more technology, more customer-centric technology to people. So if you lose less time knowing where you're going, if you find the best way to go from point A to point B, if you can fast track uh, um, you know, for immigration with you know biometric passports or digital IDs and or you know fingertips, if you can also get all your mobile uh, your pass your boarding passes mobile. Basically, if you remove a lot of the little hurdles within an airport, you can, in this case, double the capacity. I think it's pretty interesting, right? Yeah, it is interesting. And it's it's refreshing to hear an airport that's so invested in and at least investigating this stuff, if not necessarily adopting it. Yeah. And I think that's fine. I think I think it's fine to, to keep going. How can we constantly improve the experience, not just for the guests, but frankly, for their own business needs? If you can double the capacity of an existing infrastructure without having to physically add to the space that you're working with. I mean, why wouldn't you spend some time and money to look into how you could do that? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's fascinating. Read the article. It shows that there are other ways to think. I mean, we, we were talking last episode about the struggles of BA Terminal 5. We know that many other terminals in the world are reaching capacity or are at our over capacity. And it's through the first thing you think is like, oh, they need to build another terminal. And we'll talk about Frankfurt in, uh, at the end of the episode. They are about probably to, to build another one. But there are ways probably to manage current terminals to uh, accommodate more people while still maintaining a good experience. So that's, I think it's very interesting. Nobody has figured it out yet. He says as much, as much in, the, in the interview, but it's very interesting. It's th- something we'll keep an eye on. Yeah. Uh, another thing we can keep an eye on, I don't know. We, we mentioned uh, smart carry-ons, uh, but this time this company is offering you to put advertising on your uh, luggage and they'll pay for you to fly it because then, you know, it will go on the, the belt and that will be advertising. What do you think about that? Depends on how much they're going to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a cheap whore, so I will not be uh, five bucks for an average. If they're going to pay me to fly, I don't know. I don't know. I have a I have a problem endorsing anything I don't believe in. But me too. Yeah. Me too. I I don't know how I feel about this. I think you would get a certain t- um, percentage of the population who would be absolutely fine with doing that. Yeah. Free travel just to to shill a product. Is, why not? Why not? Uh, it's uh so the product doesn't exist yet. It's uh, Indiegogo, which is an equivalent of uh, Kickstarter. It's called the Orion. I'll put the link if you want to put some money in that project because you believe that. You prefer to uh, subsidize your travel with some advertising on your luggage. Why not? After all, yeah. why not? You saw something on Kickstarter, though. It's not exactly a smart carry-on. We both know that we're not huge fans of smart carry-ons, but it's a smart lock. Smart lock. Of course it is. Uh, <laughs> so it's called the air lock, and it's a it's a luggage it's a luggage lock. It's a, no, they what do they call it? The truly smart travel lock. And it can, it basically, it's a Bluetooth enabled smart travel lock. So you lock, put it on your luggage and you use your phone to lock it. Why do we always have to complicate simple <laughs> things like locks and luggage? Mm. I don't, I don't get it. Like, but there's location as well. I mean, again, what I like about it, I mean, I'm probably never going to use it. Uh, it's TSA compliant, which of course is the first thing, uh, meaning they can open it if they need to. You don't need to actually put a, you know, try to destroy your luggage to open it. But it's an add-on. So if you want to use uh, this kind of locks, you can use it. You can locate and track your luggage. If you're into that, it's nice. I prefer this approach uh, as opposed to uh, here's a carry-on that has five, 500 kilos of batteries in it. So, Yeah. 
I wish them good yeah, luck. I, I mean, they, they they have. I think they're just about to reach their uh, goal. Yeah, they're definitely they'll definitely get there. And I think it's it's sensibly priced too. Some of those some of those smart bags that we've seen were like like five hundred US dollars. Yeah, no chance. Absolutely, you could get a world class, literally bulletproof carry on for five hundred bucks. This one I think is going to be around forty five US, forty five fifty US, and given what it what it does and the fact that it's a standard secure lock isn't crazy. No, it is not. And, and there's, think, like, there's there's one thing. I mean, at first I thought it was just a bit stupid. I'll be very honest because they say you can go social with your lock. I was like, what? But apparently it means that if I'm traveling, I can allow someone else to open my lock. So I could actually give you the access to the lock. Maybe it's useful with, with couples, families. I don't know. But I mean, you know, I thought at first you can tweet your luggage i was like what but this maybe why not <laughs> the one thing i don't know is what happens when the battery runs out there's obviously a backup system i mean uh, but yeah you can apparently you can unlock it the old-fashioned way with with some kind of combo oh if the battery runs out on the actual lock mm -hmm. as opposed to because i was like well what happens if you lose your phone or your or your battery no, on the actual flight? lock that's what i'm ah, yeah, I don't know. that's anyway. a good question i I don't know. But I'm sure. I'm sure they, they thought about it. I I think there's a backup on the lock. There's a secondary way to open it. So if there's no more battery, there may be a mechanical feature. But anyway, if you're into that kind of stuff, if you are not willing to put actually of uh, the price to pay for a smart luggage, we gave you some reasons why not to buy a smart luggage in a previous episode. So please listen to it. Why not? You know, it's yeah. probably going to come out. Uh, or just buy a normal lock. <laughs> <laughs> Still talking about security. That was a very fascinating article uh, on uh, KrebsOnSecurity.com. So when you have a boarding pass nowadays, you have a barcode, you have even multiple barcodes. And with the barcode, it was able to read basically most of the information that is including some private information. Have you, have you read the article at all? Yeah, I was, I was amazed. I, when, I, when the article starts first, because it went reasonably viral, this thing. People were like, oh, don't leave your boarding passes in the seat pocket in front of you. I was like, shut up. Well, apparently, and then I read this article and I was like, yeah. Ooh, cool. some people are some people are you know putting the picture you know on Instagram etc of their boarding pass. Yeah, yeah I'm charting there next to their passport number. So like, okay, some that, of the, that's some of the stuff is not you know there's names and stuff that might not be actual and no no one can do anything about. But in the article, it shows that with. There are some locator numbers that allow to, to, know the, to know the number of the flight you're about to take, which, uh, and I'm not going to go through all the steps that let you read it, which then allows you to get, allows a hacker or somebody with bad intentions to get into your account online. Yeah. So yeah. your company account, then the access. And of course, some of the accounts I have, and I'm now I'm just doing a you know open hunt for hackers. I have my credit card details stored there. So imagine, so and you can, you can, they, they were even able to, bypass the security questions just by uh, using this information so i don't know how replicable it is but just the sensible thing is maybe not to. and you did, you had an issue was it ba or somebody was hacked recently and it was the thing where the it wasn't a lot of people but certainly there the executive club was hacked yeah i think it was ba i'm not sure there was yeah. there was the, you know it was the same thing where you could have a, a, a have credit card stored obviously it, it didn't end up being an issue for for ba but yeah it's it was a well-written and well-researched article that deserved a second look. Yeah, so uh, read the article, but if you're not interested in security, uh, because I didn't want to go into too, too many details uh, on this podcast, just maybe be careful when you post a picture of your boarding pass. It's always nice to boast about traveling in fancy destinations. We just avoid putting the barcode in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, so WikiLeaks is this... Uh, repository of classified documents by anonymous sources. What has it to do with flying? Well, there was one story that stuck for me that was kind of fun. Uh, uh, there are recommendations that were found in it, recommendations by the CIA on how to look uh, you know, normal in an airport. So how not to raise suspicion when you're traveling. And this is kind of a CIA handbook. And basically, and uh, as if we, nobody had figured out, just keep your story simple. Yeah. Do you do that? Do you keep your story simple when you travel? Because I know you're maybe a spy or something. Yeah. <laughs> just a regular Jason Bourne. <laughs> uh, 
I do. I keep my yes, yes, of course. Yeah, but really, it's 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 nothing uh, mind blowing. You know, uh, the calmer you are, the more normal you act, the less suspicions you will raise. Obviously, but yeah, <laughs> it, exactly. It was a, a definitely a headline from the newspaper of the obvious, but it was interesting. It was an interesting thing to to think that they you know, came out and said that basically. Yeah, and there are some things, you know, there are a bit of, I'll use this term discrimination, but they say, of course, that some type of jewelry or piercings or some type of clothes will rise suspicion, which yeah. sadly is a bit uh, discriminatory, but I mean, just read it. Not that we want to, we're not here to say to people that have bad intentions how to escape security, but just Sometimes I've even experienced myself in some airports, the way I'm dressed will allow me to go through customs faster than another. Uh, honestly, oh, yeah. it's just, it's, it's sad, probably a state of affair, but you know, I just don't want to stay stuck in an airport. So no. the faster I go, <laughs> the better it is. Quickly, uh, Google has released uh, a very interesting, if you work in the airline industry, if you work in an airport, so if you work in any company, actually, uh, Google has released a, a nice, a website called Rework, where they put a lot of resources about how to make the workplace better, work better by definition, obviously, as well, with data, et cetera, et cetera. The reason I mentioned it here is that the first case study they put out is JetBlue. So if you're into uh, basically human resources or strategy for airlines, it's an interesting... Very uh, interesting. It's very interesting. And it's nice for Google to actually put it out. Obviously, we know that they also want to sell their own products, but it's... These are some cases pretty well done, so I'll, I'll direct you uh, to it. Your One of your favorite airlines, Cathay, is revamping its library. Yes, they just announced this yesterday. And it's uh, it looks great. I, I really like it. When I first saw it, I was like, uh, but it's actually, even in 24 hours, has grown on me hugely. It's, it's not a total change. It's just an evolution, really, of what they uh, introduced in 1994, which was a huge change for them. They used to just have uh, a green tail with two white stripes, but now they've got this wonderful, iconic brush wing logo. And the new livery just kind of brings it up to 2015, really. It's it's and, pretty minimalistic compared to, yeah. I mean, like you say, 2015. Some people might argue that it's also, there's this term people use, Euro white, meaning that a lot of the airlines think Swiss, think Finnair, think all these, mm. uh, use a, a logo with a white background. This is why we call it Euro white. This almost looks like Euro white. I mean, I know it's not exactly a white, but it's uh, it's very simple. I like it. I think it's more, it's keeping the tradition, making it a little bit more modern, uh, minimalistic. Yeah. I like it. It's Dave, yeah, the gray band that runs down the side of the fuselage, I think, is is kind of brings it all together. They've emphasized the brushwing logo on the uh, on the front of the fuselage. They've made the the title bigger in all caps. I th I think it looks great, and I think. And they removed one color, right? There's no. They removed the red, yeah. which I miss because I think red is a very auspicious color in Chinese culture, and but also it just gave a visual, like a nice little pop. But I think it, I think it looks fantastic. Cathay is an airline that has done an extraordinary job curating its visual identity over the last twenty years. Yes. They have absolutely nailed it, and I think this is just an extension of that. Uh, an airline that has disappeared is U.S. Airways. The uh, reason I'm mentioning it is American Airlines uh, has posted a video on its YouTube channel about the final U.S. Airways flight. On the way up, it was U.S. Airways. When it landed, it was uh, American Airlines. We're never happy of seeing, uh, you know, uh, especially such airlines with such an history. And, and I like to just mention library. I like the logo and the library of U.S. Airways. It was always one of my favorites. I'm really, really saddened that it's it's disappearing. But, well, you know, history, you know, m as et cetera, it has to go to take its course. Uh, if you want to see that cute little video on American Airlines uh, YouTube video, you just follow the link on the show notes. I'm, I'm glad that they gave it the send-off that it deserved. Yeah. It wasn't just sort of a flight, a flight number disappearing. They, they, they did quite a lot of sort of ceremony around the last flights, uh, which is nice and I think appropriate. Exactly, I totally agree with you. They, they even invited, I think, the former CEO of your Airways to uh, the ceremony. So it's it's uh, it's nice, like you say. It shows they care a bit more than just you know you know like you said a number. Uh, Frankfurt. So Frankfurt Airport, we both know it, right? You you've been flying through it as well, right? 
Yeah, a few times, but no, definitely not not as uh, <laughs> not as many times as you. Well, you know, if you live in Europe and if you are on Star Alliance, which uh, remind for the people who don't know is in Europe, Lufthansa, uh, Swiss, Austrian. So if you fly Lufthansa, there are chances you'll be flying out either of Munich, which we covered already in another episode, of or Frankfurt. Frankfurt, I, I have mixed feelings, as I said in the introduction of this show, because it's it's the third busiest airport in Europe. So it's a very, very big airport. It's the uh, first one is Heathrow, obviously. Second one is uh, Charles de Gaulle. We'll cover that one one day. <laughs> but um, the layout of this airport is strange, or it's strange is maybe not the right word. It, they've added piers after piers. So it looks, you know, if you look at the purely design perspective, it doesn't look completely strange like something like JFK, where it doesn't seem to make any sense. The fact is they call themselves the hub experts. If you look at every bus on uh, on the tarmac, you'll have a little thing next to the, the, the name of the Frankfurt Airport says the hub experts. Well, uh, yeah, there are times you have to walk and walk and walk and walk and walk even more. Have you experienced that? <laughs> I have. I, I I definitely have. And I think one of the things that you, for if, you, if you're not familiar with the airport, and this has caught me out a couple of times, is you walk and walk and walk, and you come to like a cluster of restaurants and sh- stores, and you go, "Gosh, my, my I'm, I'm like 45 gates away from where I need to be." And like, oh no, no, I'll be fine. I'll go get something at the. And then it's just like gates. And gates and gates and gates and gates and gates and gates and nothing until well nothing and you're like god damn it I just walked for like an hour and a half yeah so you <laughs> had to go back so now you 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 know you're not wondering uh, anymore why they were one of the first airports airports in the world to offer you on their app a wayfinding solution because it's clever it's, it's uh, very clever so especially so if you have to uh, there are two terminals terminal one terminal two terminal one is by far the most much bigger terminal two is is uh, is much smaller they're thinking about building a terminal three. But Terminal 1, of course, there are, you know, parts of it where with like every airport within the uh, European Union, some parts are Schengen, so meaning you don't have to pass through security yeah. if you stay. Some are not. Alex and myself, since we are living in the UK, we're not in Schengen, so we have to go through. And it's at that point that something, sometimes it breaks down because if you have to move from one to another gate, sometimes if you go from, for instance, C to Z, I don't know, there's Z, and you know, of course, it's uh, C, B, A, Z, that's how it's laid out. <laughs> of course. So you have to really walk a lot. So you have to think about the time it's going to take. I know I've, gave, I've given you, Alex, this kind of uh, advice because you're about to fly. We just said you were flying to uh, from uh, Frankfurt to Astana. They yeah, are uh, an hour layover. You definitely also look, uh, take, if you don't want to use the app, and that also not only applies to Alex, but anyone listening, take a screenshot of the uh, the terminal map on the Frankfurt Airport website because it shows you where are the different uh, security passages. And there's a lot of different security. You cannot, of course, choose which security you will go through, but it's sometimes when you arrive at a gate and you're supposed to reach another gate, there are many ways to reach that other gates. And f- few securities are a pain because they're so slow. Mm. Even if you're in premium, so even if you're in first or, or a business, or if you have status, they are a pain to actually go through. So be very careful. And, and be also, uh, even if you don't have the map, have your eyes open because sometimes you'll see a sign that says, go straight and security is over there. And if you suddenly look at the left, you see another security, which no one is using it it honestly happens it has happened to me i still don't know the airport by heart but that's the biggest tip i would give to anyone who's there is to be very mindful of the you know they've created these um pathways probably to the one that made better sense for most of people but sometimes if you don't follow the signs you'll still find your way and you'll go faster but just be careful. You'll have to walk and walk, uh, obviously. Another thing, if you're in Terminal 2, uh, Terminal 2, some of the uh, the gates have security at the gate, so before you get the gate. For those who are active listeners of our show, you remember I had this story when they had to, they took every single piece of I equipment a, out. just about to ask you about that. I thought it was Frankfurt, but I wasn't 100% So the sure. official policy of Frankfurt is to ask you to include in the electronics that you have to put out of your bag, that includes all batteries, right? Uh, other airports might decide if you have, let's say, you know, an external smartphone battery that you can leave it in your bag. So they will ask you to remove it. 
that day when I was at this at that uh, gate, I was about to fly Emirates. They asked me to remove every single cable. Imagine my backpack is basically full of cables, batteries. So they and they scan every single one of them individually. So just make sure that you ask them before you do. It just can sometimes take a long time. The advantage, however is that these are uh, gates, uh, security gates uh, at the gates. So there are only the people that fly there. You don't have to sometimes wait like in Terminal 1 forever for if you're unlucky and you have multiple international flights arriving at the same time. Also, uh, they can be a little bit sometimes stiff as set of insecurity uh, about if they, if they consider that something is not supposed to be in your bag, they will just not discard it. They will say, oh, go back and discard it and then come back, which means you might have to queue again. So be also very uh, wary of that. I'm not saying it always happens. It's not a criticism. It's just different kind of policies. But it can be so strange, isn't it? But it's still a good airport. It's still it's just the layout is a bit strange. Some people think it's worse than Heathrow in terms of experience. I don't agree. I think it's actually, I don't agree with that either. Uh, ter- transiting be- between Terminal 1 and 2, which could happen depending on the kind of routing you do, If you have, especially if you have different airlines might be uh, a bit long, so just be, be aware of that. Uh, Alex, you are th- staying in the same terminal, I think? Terminal 2, yeah. yeah. So uh, you'll have no uh, you have no issues about it with Terminal 2 at all. It's a smaller terminal. I like it. And actually, I say, if, you, if you're ever transiting there through there or going out of there around Christmas time, the ger- all the German Christmas food and all of the you know accoutrement that comes with it, is all over and it's it, oh, it's such so good so good the food the the candies the cakes which is kind of my weakness but yeah it's it, that's kind of why i like flying through there around this time of year so i will be stocking up and if you do have a biometric passport the they've now installed uh, bio bio gates e gates i don't know how you call them for immigration that goes so quick the ones yeah. at Ethereum for me i have a swiss passport usually with me because i have other passports are so slow in recognizing my face. I don't know what I do. And maybe I'm so tired when I arrive at Ethro, the computers are just completely out of whack. <laughs> but at Frankfurt, it's snappy, extremely snappy. Also, same thing for gates themselves. Some of them are installed with uh, doors, also e-doors that open just by scanning. So there's no more people to scan for you. The boarding pass, you just scan it, the doors open and you leave. Like, like in a subway i would say so it can be extremely efficient thinking that they're thinking yeah. about efficiency and it's a nice airport too there's a lot of shops a lot of good stuff like you said not only at christmas it's always good if you if you're lucky to have uh, uh, status on on lufthansa their lounges are really cool uh whether it's the business one the senator one i've never done the first class on there's even a terminal so there's a separate terminal so they will if, you've, if you don't know what Han is, it's this kind of very high status they have, they have on Lufthansa. You need to fly 600,000 miles every two years to maintain it. So it's just, what? yes, it's like, but, and I was lucky to do it once because somebody else, I was delayed on a flight uh, connecting to Frankfurt and they had no choice but to put me in that car to drive me to the next plane because nice. there was a CEO of a very famous company with me in the car. So they said, do you mind if he's coming with us? So they, they will have Porsche Cayenne, they have BMWs, big fat Audis, Mercedes 500. And they will not only carry you to the next plane if you're late, otherwise they will carry you to the first class terminal. It's an entirely separate terminal. I've never visited it. But if, you, if you're that kind of flyer, that's a good reason to actually yeah, do a layover at Frankfurt. Through, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so is it is it good for labor? Yeah, it's it's okay I for would layover. Say so it's not too far from the city. So if you have a few hours, there's an airport hotel, et cetera, as, as these kind of uh, airports are. But you could go to the city. It's a nice city. Uh, people are a little bit put off. Usually they say, yeah, but that's the financial district of Germany. Well, I have very good memories. It's a very nice city and the people are very agreeable. One thing, though, if you, uh, that you might not know is that Uber is, uh, so it's yeah. not forbidden, the, you know, the black, the, the traditional Uber, but they're stopping their service at Hamburg, Frankfurt, and Düsseldorf because of the regulation they have to follow. They haven't found enough drivers. That's what they said. Uh-huh. So there's no Uber to fl- to get you there. Uh, and finally, uh, just a few tidbits: the uh, the airport will uh, see a massive increase. Uh, they expect 90 million passengers by 2020. So they're building a new uh, terminal. 
they want to build another runway, but they have the same problem as in many airports. People around are complaining too much. So we'll see where it goes. But it's and they have pretty fancy stuff. If you're into that, they have uh, you know the the cars that uh, take the uh, that carry the planes. Oh, the tugs. Yeah. So they have some that are bots, basically. So That's it's, very cool. uh, everything is remote controlled and you know with self driving stuff like that. So they do a lot of fancy stuff, not only for the customer. So it's a uh, it's a cool airport. I like it. Nice. But mixed feelings because of the walk. So, guys, if anyone from Frankfurt listening, do something about that walking thing. Yeah, give us segues. <laughs> awesome. It's the best thing I've ever heard. Uh, yeah, that, I vote for Alex as uh, CEO of Frankfurt Airport. There you I, go. I can Sold. jump anyone you want. Guys, on that, thank you very much, Alex. Safe travels. On behalf of layovers and the entire crew, we would like to thank you for joining us on this podcast today. And we're looking forward to seeing you on board again next week. Flight attendants, please prepare for landing.